Just step up where you got to step up and get something done, amen. That's how it works for the Lord, amen. Make yourself available. Amen. You never know when you'll need to be used. Amen. Miss Hannah out tonight. And Luke knew one song. Amen. Played it, and that was great. Amen. Amen. You kids, learn something. Do something for the Lord. Learn one. And then we'll have another one. Amen. Right. And learn another, and then we'll have three. Yeah. Then get another, and we'll have four. Amen. Just concentrate on what you got and get something done for the Lord. Amen. Amen. Good to be back tonight. Amen. We got a letter on to share this with you before we get started. We are in the book of Genesis. Uh, but we did get a, a letter from Brother Reuben uh, down in Mexico where we had sent the money back during, well, it's been two years now for that building project. We sent some money down there. He said, Dear Pastor and Hopewell Church, matter of fact, there's a big old bulletin about this big set on the bulletin board. You can see some pictures about what I'm about to read. He said, First, we want to apologize for not being able to send you a report on the blessing you were uh, in, uh, in helping us build a church up in the mountains with the Indian people. Uh, we had purchased land to build the church, but the people of the community didn't want the church in their place. And they gave us many problems, and we had to stop building. We were having services in, pastors, in the pastor's house, and after about eight months later, the pastor took it to the jungle and the authorities of the community or the judge, not the jungle, the judge and the authorities of the community. After hearing both sides of the story, the judge told the people to leave us alone that a church was going to be a blessing to their families. Praise the Lord that, the, that today the Sower Baptist Church is preaching the gospel and souls are being saved. The pastor called us last week and told us that some of the men that were against the building of the church now are attending services. Amen. That's how God works. The devil's going to try to fight anything you do for the Lord, but if you press on, God will give the increase. He said, praise the Lord. God is so good. The church is doing great. We still need uh, to build a Sunday school space for the kids and two bathrooms, but we, have, but we will build as God supplies. Thank you for giving to make it this possible. Although it has taken more than two years to get this church built, it has been worth it all. God has been doing great things in the place of Ten Cahoostas. I probably didn't pronounce that right. To God be the glory, great things he has done. Please keep Pastor Hugo uh, and his family in your prayers that God will continue to bless them and many souls will come to know Jesus as their personal Savior. We are sending a USB memory, this right in here, uh, so we can see a video. With a short video and a poster so you can rejoice with us seeing what God has done. Once again, thank you for the blessing uh, you have been to our ministry. May God bless you in our prayers, Brother Reuben and Valerie uh, Morello. So thank God for that, amen. We'll try to get something we can maybe show this thing one night and let you see what's going on. Or you maybe could take it home and pass it around and watch it at the house. So thank the Lord, amen. Something's getting done in Mexico. Thank God for what's getting done in North Carolina, amen. Genesis chapter number 6. Genesis chapter number 6. We'll do something a little bit different. We've been traveling through the book of Genesis. We're starting to enter into chapter 6. Amen. What we want to do tonight, it's kind of like the book of Revelation. When you read the book of Revelation, of course, there's four different times they go through the great tribulation because there's four times the Lord shows up. We know He only shows up once. But the book of Revelation is kind of like the first... Gospels of, first, of the first account of Christ when he showed up in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The book of Revelation is kind of broke down in that same type of fashion after the church is seen taken out in chapter 4 and then the tribulation period and then uh, eternity and the end of the book. But within that, uh, the sequel of events going through the book of Revelation, there are what's called parenthetical chapters. Some of you might remember when we studied the book of Revelation, a parenthetical chapter is kind of like in within the parentheses, like if you would write a sentence. You'd have some information, and then, it, then there'd be a little bit more information within the parentheses. The book of Revelation has some parenthetical chapters where there's a sequel of events going on, and then God would use a whole chapter with a parenthetical parentheses, and that whole chapter would give you some general information about what's going on, but it wouldn't keep up with the sequel of events. And so we've been studying through the book of Genesis. We've came to Noah here in the building of the ark. But before we get directly into chapter 6, 
I want to give you a parenthetical sermon of the events that's been going on. It's like we're going through, we're going to hit the Noah and the flood. And I'm going to give you a parenthetical sermon tonight with some general information that kind of overlaps a, a broader view of what's going on. And then we'll get right back into chapter 6 as the Lord sees fit next time. Amen. So let's read Genesis chapter 6, verse 1 through 8. Amen. What's hot in here tonight, ain't it? Everybody hot? Is anybody cold? Oh, Lord, help. Turn the air heat off. <laughs> we got her outnumbered. Get that girl a blanket. Amen. Amen. Tim Sellers, you, Brother Jeff, you cold? Feels good to you? So leave it like it is? <laughs> Je- Miss Lynette's hot? Man, cut the heat off. That air keep it stirred. Somebody cut that thing down. Cut it off. Amen. Genesis chapter number 6. Appreciate that, D'Angelo. If Miss Lynette's hot, it is hot. Amen. Genesis chapter 6. If Brother Jeff gets cold, we'll cut it back on. <laughs> Amen. He's been stoking a fire in a tent for two weeks. Amen. He's good. Amen. Genesis chapter number 6. So we're looking at this parenthetical message. Uh, Genesis 6 verse number 1. Got a lot of things I want to say tonight. We'll try to be very... Uh, we'll watch the clock, amen. Richie's turned around, looked that way, and then Richie's wife looked back, and everybody's looking at the clock. Genesis 6, verse 1. What's the first word there? And, the, and it came to pass. Well, thank God for that saying. Things do come to pass. When men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them. So as the Genesis is flowing through, God started this thing with Adam and Eve, and then Cain and Abel. Cain, Cain rose up and slew Abel. Amen. And God uh, give them another child, Seth. And through those lineage of children, men begin to multiply upon the earth. So there's a great multitude of people by this time on the earth. The Bible said and there were daughters born unto them. Verse 2 said that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair. And they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man. For that he also is flesh, yet his day shall be a hundred and twenty years. So now the flood's about to take place. The lifespan of mankind is about to change. Well, they've been living a multitude of years up to this point. I believe it has something to do with the atmosphere, that the flood caused a lot of changes in our environment. Amen. But uh, here's a flood coming. The uh, life of mankind's not going to be as long. Bible said in verse 4, so he's given some general information right prior to the flood. And there's these sons of God. They've chose daughters of men, and they laid with one another. And God's upset at what he saw and said, my spirit's not always going to strive with man, for he also is flesh. Verse 4, there were giants in the earth in those days. And also after that, when the sons of God came unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. So these sons of God have laid with these daughters of men. They produced giants within the land, mighty men of renown. God's upset at what he's seen. His spirit's not going to strive with them, verse 5. And God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth. And that every imagination of the thoughts of their heart was only evil continued. So you see this thing building up of the wickedness that's going on that has God so upset that his spirit's no longer going to go to strive that he's going to send a great catastrophe to this earth which is called the great flood of Noah and he's going to flood the whole earth and destroy everybody except for Noah, his wife, his sons, and his three daughters-in-law. Daughters-in-laws. So the Bible says that he sees their imagination, their thoughts are only evil continually. Verse 6, and it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repented me that I made them, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Now take your Bible with me and look at Matthew chapter number 24. Like I said, this is a parenthetical message. 
We'll give you some general information about what's about to go on, and can, we're going to compare it to the future events. Amen. Noah, and you'll see in just a minute where we're going. Some of you might already have a good idea. Idea. Matthew chapter number 24. So God is upset at what the earth, uh, the people on the earth. He sees the wickedness that's going on, that God's going to destroy this earth. And so he find, Noah finds grace and builds an ark, and God floods the earth and destroys it. But up to that point, God has been given some gentle information that's leading up to that great flood that has God so upset that he's going to destroy the earth. Matthew chapter number 24, look in verse number 3. And what's the first word there? And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, this is the Lord Jesus Christ. It's when he walked in shoe leather. The Bible said the disciples came unto him privately, saying, so the disciples has came, saying, tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? The disciples has showed up to Jesus, and they said, hey, when is these things going to be? What's the signs of thy coming, and what's going to uh, be at the end of the world? And so Jesus is about to answer these three questions in Matthew 24 and 25. The Bible says in Matthew 24 and verse number 4, here's the first thing that he said to him. Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying I am Christ, and shall deceive many. They said, Hey, Lord, before you come, the end of the world, What's the signs going to be like? What's it going to be like when we get to that point so we'll know we're there? We'll know we're at the end. He said, well, one thing, people are going to come saying they're me and they're not. The Bible said in verse 6, and ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Verse 7, for nations shall rise against nations and kingdoms against kingdoms. And there shall be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in diverse places. Do you know when you're reading the events that's prior to the second coming of the Lord? Not his first coming when he showed up. The second time when he comes back at the end of the great tribulation, which is seven years uh, uh, before the rapture of the church. The next event is for God to step out of the cloud and call us home. There's going to be a seven-year great tribulation period, and the Lord's going to come back, and the disciples are saying, what's the signs of that time? And he says, these are the signs of the end of the world and of my coming. What are they? People are going to come saying they're Christ. What are they doing that today? Amen. It ain't doing them getting bigger. He said, there, you're going to hear wars and rumors of wars. Hey, people scared to death there's going to be a nuclear war right now. What's going to break out between the nations? Hey, you're going to find there's going to be pestilence. Boy, they're everywhere. COVID-19. Hey, there's killing people, knocking people off left and right. Hey, we are seeing the fulfillment of the things of the end of the world. And we're seven years at least from that if it happened, the rapture took place today. We're already seeing the signs of the second coming. Yeah. But when Jesus comes to rapture the church, he's rapturing the church, not this building, all born again believers. Amen. But when he comes back at the second coming, he's coming to the earth, he's coming to restore that thing with Israel, grab back in that uh, natural branch, Romans 11, right? And they, they are the ones looking for a sign. The Jews uh, uh, seek wisdom, uh, the, the Greeks seek wisdom, but the Jews require a sign. And these Jews are saying, what's going to be the signs? You know what? Hey, we're not looking for the signs. We're looking for the Lord to step out on the cloud, right? But if we can already see the signs, but we're close to the rapture. That's the picture here. Hey, we're already seeing the signs. They said that, uh, I think it was yesterday. Did I read it right? Some of y'all read that? That all the earthquakes that took place in South Carolina? Lots of them. Divers places. Hey, what is that? Hey, hey, God, I know it's not for us. The signs are not for the church. They're for the Jews. But, boy, if you can already see the signs of the end of the world, hey, we might better tighten up. We might to get out of here. Amen. He says, verse 8, all these things are the beginning of sorrows. 
Look down to verse number 32. And he goes on to deal with some things about the tribulation, so we're skipping that. We're trying to look at a general picture here in a, in a, in a spiritual point. Verse 32, the Bible said, Now learn a parable of the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender and put up of leaves, ye know that summer is not. I mean, when you see the leaves falling off and turning all the different colors, you know it's fall. When they start budding up, you know it's summer, right? That's what he's saying. You can tell by the trees of seasons. Look at verse 33. So likewise, just the example he gave, ye, when ye shall see all these things, know that it is near, even close at the door. And just as you can tell the seasons by the leaves and the budding and falling off, hey, when you see these signs that the Lord spoke about, he's saying, hey, you better take notice. Something's about to happen. Look in verse number uh, 34. Verily, ver verily, I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Hey, God said it is going to happen. Amen. Look, verse 36. But of that day, an hour, the day that he's been, at, he's been asked about, the day that he's been describing, of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Here's the picture I want you to see. Verse 37. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. You see that? Jesus is describing the end of the world. And he said, listen, boys, you want to know what it's going to be like? I've already gave you some stuff that you can see the signs, the earthquakes, the pestilence, uh, many coming in the name of Christ and they're not him, amen. Hey, hey, just destruction and hell raising all over the earth. He said, also, it's going to be just like the days of Noah. If you want to know what it's going to be like when I come back, go back there in Genesis chapter 4, 5, and 6 and see what it was like prior to me flooding this earth because it's just going to be just like the days of Noah. What was going on in that day are types and signs and pictures of my second coming. Amen. That flood was a type of the judgment of God. Do you know who got out of here before the flood? Enoch. Yeah. He walked with God and he was not for God. Took him. Who's Enoch? We've studied him. He's a type of the church. Hey, we get now before the flood, before the judgment, before the tribulation period, amen, before Christ comes back to the earth. He said these signs are pictures and types. So we're looking at this parenthetical message tonight to see the comparison of Christ's second coming and the, uh, the, the flood of Noah of what it's going to be like before God comes back to this earth. Amen. We're going to look at some of that tonight. He said just like it was the days of Noah. Verse 38, and as in the, day, in, in the days they were, uh, that were before the flood, what were they doing? Eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark. It ain't no different today. You know what they're doing? Raising hell. Eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage like we got forever and eternity we're going to be on this whole earth. Hey, that's why they live in the days of Noah. Hey, those signs and pictures are there with the judgment that was coming. And he says, it's going to be just like my second coming. Ain't going to be no different, amen. They're going to be eating, drinking, giving in marriage, making plans like we got forever. We ain't got forever. That's why they're going to live. People live today like they got forever. And they, they ain't never going to give an account. God ain't never going to show up. Hey, you better wake up and smell the coffee. Hey, man, it caught those people off guard when the flood came, and I guarantee you it's going to catch people off guard when God shows up at the end of the great tribulation period. And even seven years prior at the rapture. Yeah, amen. We're living like, hey, we got all time in the world. Let's just live for the world and enjoy ourselves. And not realizing that, hey, to, uh, uh, today could be our last day. Yeah, amen. We could be taking in our last breaths. Yeah, amen. Look, verse 39. And no, not till the flood came and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. He said, Then shall two be in the field, and one shall be taken, and the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill, the one shall be taken, and the other left. Watch therefore, for ye know not 
What hour the Lord doth come. But know this, that if the goodman of the house had known in what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and would have not have suffered his house to be broken up. If you knew a thief was coming tonight, you wouldn't go to sleep. You got any sense, you'd be sitting there with a shotgun or a rifle or a pistol and ready to blow him down. You sure don't want me under the covers with your eyes closed and unconscious of your surroundings. Because he might come in and kill you and do who knows what. And the Lord said he's compared just like the Lord coming. If you knew he's, Do you not know he's coming? Amen. Verse number 34, 44. Therefore be ye also ready. For in such an hour as you think not, Amen. the Son of Man coming. Amen. Let's pray. Brother Jeff, how about pray for us, brother? Thank you, Lord. Yes, yes, it is. Thank you, Lord. Help us, Lord. Amen, amen. Brother Rich, I know the title's a little long. Maybe you can condense it and get it on what you've got to do. But I want to preach on this thought, the days of Noah and the coming of the Son of Man. The days of Noah and the coming of the Son of Man. He says this in verse number, uh, let's see here, verse 37. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the, day, in, in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that, uh, that Noah entered into the ark. Hey, Jesus is coming again. Amen. Whether we believe it or not, whether we have been lulled to sleep by our flesh or the world or the devil, Jesus is coming again at the end of the great tribulation period. That's what Matthew 24 is speaking about, the end of all things. What are the signs of the end of the world and of thy coming? His coming, literal coming, will take place on this earth at the end of the great tribulation period. And if we are already seeing the signs that the Lord spoke about, just some of them, and we'll look at some more tonight in the book of uh, Genesis that, pre uh, that preceded Noah's flood, which are a type, as the Lord said, of his coming. He said that himself, so we can literally take that as facts of the, uh, prior to the flood of Noah is a type uh, and picture of his second coming. And if we are already seeing those signs, and the tribulation backs up, uh, the rapture backs up seven years before the end of the great tribulation period. Because the great tribulation period is seven years, three and a half years of some peace by the Antichrist, and then the great tribulation the last three and a half years, the church leaves before all seven. We're not getting out in the middle. We're not getting out of the end. Hey, we're getting out here before all of Jacob's trouble. That's Israel. God's taking the bride home. Hey, the book of Revelation, amen, there was a window open in heaven before any destruction of the tribulation that was described. The church was taken home, amen. But if we can see the signs, and we're at least, if God would come back today and rapture us out, we're at least seven years from those great signs. Uh, that great event happened, but we can see the signs. We're close. To the coming of the Lord. Amen. 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 We're close. Amen. We're not far away. Jesus is coming to straighten this mess out. As the great Jack Wood said, uh, he, uh, Jack, uh, he said, Brother Wood said, uh, the Lord is coming and boy is he mad. He's going to straighten out this mess. Look in Job chapter number 19. God's coming. Let me give you a little verses here. Let's loosen our Bible. Job chapter number 19. Job Psalms, right? Job 19, the Lord is coming to straighten out this mess. When I say he's coming, I'm talking about the great tribulation period. At the end of it, when he comes back to the earth. Amen, the Lord is coming to straighten it out. Amen, and we're, matter of fact, if you're saved, we're coming with him. Yeah. We're going to be raptured out in the seven-year tribulation period going on earth. We're going to be up in heaven getting all these things ironed out at the uh, judgment seat of Christ and giving account of what we've done in this body, whether it be good or bad. And God's preparing us to ride back on the stallions to straighten it out. Uh, the Lord is coming. Job 19. Look what Job said in verse number 25. Some people say the oldest book ever written was the book of Job. And here's what he said before he had any Bible, if that be true. He, the Bible said in Job 19, 25, he said this, For I know that my Redeemer lived. Yeah, yeah. He had a little bit of insight about something, didn't he? Amen. 
he had limited God on his what he had, and that, that he shall stand at the latter day upon what? The earth. That ain't the rapture. He stepped coming out of the cloud. Hey, that latter day on the earth, or that latter millennial reign that's going to take place after the tribulation. He said, I know that my Redeemer living. Hey, Amen. Hey, he knew he was going to die and get up whatever happened, man. He said, I know he living, and he's going to stand upon the earth in the latter day. Look at verse 26. He said, and though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God. You know what? If God don't come back tomorrow and rapture the church, or maybe 50 years from now, they lay my body in a old casket out here in this old graveyard, hey, and the worms eat this body, I know just like Job, I'm going to see him one day, and I'm going to stand with him on this earth, and he's going to rule and reign with a rod of iron, and maybe by the grace of God, by something I've done for him, God will let me reign with him. Amen. Amen. Hey, I know it's going to happen. Jesus is coming again. He's going to give an account. We're going to give an account. This world's going to be straight now. Look in Isaiah chapter number 9. Isaiah 9. Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Isaiah chapter number 9. Isaiah chapter number 9. I said the Lord's coming to straighten this mess out. He's going to reign and stand on this earth. Isaiah chapter number 9 is a prophecy. A lot of it talks about the first coming, but not every bit of it. Some of it's yet to be fulfilled. When you read the prophecies of Isaiah here in Isaiah chapter number 9, look in verse number 6. You'll know some of it as, as the Christmas story or the first coming of the Lord. The Bible said in Isaiah 9 and 6, For unto us a child is born. He was, wasn't he? The Bible said unto us a son is given. He was not only flesh, he was God. A son born, a, 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 child, a, a child born, a son given. There's the God man. The child was born, he had flesh, but the son was given, he was God, right? Look in verse 6. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. Never was. Government wasn't on his shoulders. The government rejected him. They said, we'll have no king but Caesar. Now the son was born. Hey, the child was born, the son was given, right? But the government wasn't on his shoulders. Hey, this prophecy ain't always, uh, all of it's been fulfilled. That's why you can read a verse of Scripture and you're not careful trying to make it all be fulfilled at one time. Hey, that thing will break up right in the middle of it. Matter of fact, before you ever got to the middle of it, something wasn't, wasn't even fulfilled. But you better rest assured just as the fact that child was born on this earth in that manger, little kids. Hey, listen to the preacher tonight. Hey, he was born to a virgin, amen. He was conceived of the Holy Ghost. He lived on this earth for 33 and a half years. Hey, he, a, son was, a child was born, a son was given. But you rest assured that child that was laying in that manger, that baby that Mary held, hey, that they hung on an old rugged cross, the Lamb of God was taking away the sin of the He's coming back as the lion of the tribe of Judah, Lord of lords and king of kings. And he's going to straighten out this mess on earth. Hey, he's coming and the government's going to be upon his shoulders. Look what he says here. He said, and his name shall be called Wonderful. Hey, thank God. I love the name already, don't you? Brother preached about it the other night. That Jesus, brother, great preaching. He said, Counselor. The mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. Yeah. It's very obvious that these things have not been fulfilled yet. Amen. Upon the throne of David and upon the, his kingdom to order it, that's the millennial, and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will, will, Perform this. It's going to happen. Jesus is coming. And he's going to straighten this mess out. Let me give you another. Look at Zechariah. If you've got to Matthew and you flip back to Malachi, you would find Zechariah. That's the best way to do it, amen, unless you're real good at it. And if you are, glory be to God, we tip the hat to you. Zechariah chapter number 14. Hey, amen. If you find Malachi, you just flip back. Last chapter in Zechariah. Jesus is coming. He said, just like the days of Noah. Shows how the coming of the Son of Man be. Disciples said, hey, when's it going to happen? What's going to be the signs? What's it going to be like? Amen. Zechariah 14, look in verse number 4. The Bible said, and his feet, you see that? Shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall, shall clave in the midst, therefore toward the east and toward the west. 
You remember when the Lord told Moses, he said, take my people to the other side there? And they came up to that, that Red Sea and it split and they walked on on dry ground. The Bible said the Lord going to step on the Mount of Olives and he's going to split that thing in half. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Acts chapter number 1, when he was ascended up into glory and they, they, these, these men in, in shining garments stood by and all the crowd stand up watching him go up in the sky and those men in shining garments said, hey, why stand you gazing? Where was he at? He was going up on the Mount of Olives. He said, that, this same Jesus which you see go up in heaven shall so come in like manner. Hey, where did he get that from? Well, he got it from God, number one. He got it from uh, uh, Zechariah right here in chapter number 14. That same Jesus that left the Mount of Olives, he's coming back in like manner. He going to step out on that mountain and split it asunder. He's coming again. The Bible says this, look. He said, uh, which is before Jerusalem on the east, the, and the Mount of Olives shall clave in the midst uh, thereof toward the east and toward the west, and there shall be a very great valley, and half of the mountain shall remove toward the north, and half of it toward the south. Look in verse number 9. The Bible says this, and the Lord shall be king over all the earth. In that day shall there be one Lord, and his name won. He's coming again. He's coming again. Just like I just quoted in Acts chapter number 1. Look in Jude. Right before the book of Revelation. Jude 14. Amen. He's coming again. Acts 1 11 if you want that reference. Jude 14 and 15. The Lord's coming. He said just, just, just like the days of Noah. Eating and drinking. Having a good time. And the flood came and destroyed them all. Hey the Lord's coming again. And he's coming to straighten this mess out. Jude, verse number 14. The Bible says this. And Enoch also, remember him over there? Talking about Noah. Here's the comparison again. Also the seventh from Adam prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. Enoch told him. That ain't even recorded in Genesis that Enoch said it. You read Genesis, you'll never find Enoch done that. But walk with God when he was not, and the Lord took him. And Jude said Enoch was prophesying. Where did he get that from? That's a long span between Enoch and Jude show up, show, showed up. Hey, man, he got it from God. You say, that can't be true. Maybe he got it in the lost book of Enoch. He didn't get out of the lost book of Enoch. He got it from the Holy Ghost. Amen. And the Holy Ghost inspired Jude to write about it. Amen. He said he's coming with ten thousands of his saints. Look at what he's coming to do. Verse 15. To execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Hey, God's coming. He's going to straighten this mess out. He said just like the days of Noah. Show us how the coming of the Son of Man be. Prior to that, as we've already said, the rapture will take place. Just as there's verses that speak about the second coming literally stepping out on earth like Job said, like he said here to execute judgment, hey, God's going to step out of the cloud one day and call me and you home. He said in John chapter number 14, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. That's what the Lord said. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. He said, I go to prepare a place for you. Thank God he did. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again to receive you unto myself that where I am there you may be also. Hey, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he says, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trump shall sound and the dead shall be raised. That's what he said in 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4. The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God. The dead in Christ is getting up and we going home to be with the Lord. Hey, God's going to rapture us out prior to this judgment. But we're already seeing the signs of the judgment. We're already seeing it. We're looking at it. But as the days of Noah were, or know he were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. When we look at those days, the days that the Lord described in Matthew 24, when we look back at those days prior to the flood, which the Lord said we can do, as the days of Noah were, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. So the flood is a, is a perfect type and picture of the second coming of the Lord, God redeeming Israel. Enoch left out before. There's the type of the church. 
You can probably make a little type and application of the, uh, the art being the rapture. But literally the Lord used it as a type of his coming to this earth. And when we look at those days of prior to the flood, Matthew 24, him speaking about his coming, do they not remind us of these days? When we look at those days, cannot we see these days? Sure we can. The days of Noah and the coming of the Son of Man. Let's show you some things tonight. Look back in the book of Genesis. Let's look at those days. Let's see what kind of truths we can glean about God's coming back. He's coming again. People better wake up. Look in Genesis chapter 4. Genesis chapter 4 five, and 5 are the two chapters that begin to give insight prior to the flood days. And they give us some insight of what the earth was like that Jesus said as the days of Noah were. So shall the coming of the Son of Man be. So what was it in the days of Noah? Let me say first of all, and we'll have to be very quickly. Number one, I see religious apostasy. Do you know what it's going to be like before the Lord comes? The same thing it was in Noah's day. You know what was going on in Noah's day? There was religious apostasy. What do you mean? There was all kind of garbage under the sun except the truth. Well, I should say not except the truth. They were some truth because Abel offered a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. Abel showed the true way of, of, of approaching God. Hey, he, he showed up with the blood. Hey, man, he showed up with something that God had given where Cain had showed up with something he had done by his own works. And boy, it's just like it was in the days of Noah. Hey, people's working and trying to gain their way to heaven. It's just like that today. It's religious apostasy. Hey, you'd be surprised at the people to have no clue on how to go to heaven. In the day that we're living in where churches are all over, we'll just use America, not necessarily the world, but you can back it all the way back to North Carolina. You can even back it all the way up to Richmond County. Of all the churches all over the place, how many people have no clue on how to go to heaven? How many people are still working their hands to death, are still getting baptized in water and joining churches and giving money, thinking that's going to gain them heaven, amen? Well, it was just like it was in the days of Noah. Everybody's doing their good deeds and thinking they're all right while they live like hell, might I say. Hey, without the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, hey, hey, religious apostasy is everywhere. People ain't got no clue. You say, how you know that, preacher? Because I've told to them. And if you witnessed and handed out tracts and invited people to church, you'll find out how many people think it is their good deeds and not the good deeds of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's religious apostasy. They're eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage. And every good old boy in the South is going to heaven if you hear him talk. Every one of them's born again, but they ain't got no clue on how to be born again. You ask people today, I, I challenge you, go out this week, find the first ten people you see and ask them are they saved. And I guarantee you probably all ten will say yes. And if you ask that same 10 people, how did you get it? You'd probably get 10 different answers. And you might, might find one that really knows. And you don't believe me, do you? I can see where you're looking at me. You think everybody knows how to be saved. Everybody don't know how to be saved. Well, we hear, well, are you saved? Yeah, I'm saved. We take it like, well, they say because they know what you know. They ain't got a clue. They ain't got a clue. You're born again. Yeah, I'm born again. What do you mean born again? Well, I was in the hospital, and, and, I, and I had a disease, and the Lord touched me. Well, that's good. Well, where's you born again? Where, yeah, right. They ain't got a clue. Right. The world has no clue. That's why you need to witness. That's why you need to give gospel tracts out. That's why you need to dig in a little bit deeper and find out what they're saying when they say they're saved. Right. They say they're saved. We'll say, well, I'll see you in heaven. You might not never see them in heaven if they don't know God. They, you will not see them in heaven unless they get saved. Yeah. Hey, it's religious apostasy. Genesis chapter 4, verse 1 through 7, it shows the picture there with Cain and Abel. We looked at it. It's the way of Cain. That's what the Lord calls it, the way of Cain. It's works, it's good deeds, it's our efforts and not God. Matthew 24, verse 4 and 5, the first thing Jesus said, what's going to be the signs of the coming? He said, take heed that no man deceive you. You know what? People are deceived by religious apostasy. They're They're deceived by religion. They think religion is going to get them to heaven. Religion gets nobody to heaven. Salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ gets people to heaven. And you hear it all the time. Glory be to God. We ought to speak it all the time. We ought to be very clear about it. Hey, but here's what the problem is sometimes. I would say it's a problem because we ought to always mention it. Maybe here's what the problem is with our, our thinking, I should say, that we think everybody hears it the same way. They don't. People don't know. 
Now, I'm not saying we got a monopoly on it and we're better than everybody else. If you think like that, you're not right neither, amen. I'm just talking about religious apostasy, how it is today. Don't be deceived and naive to think that people know how to go to heaven. 21 years of my life, I grew up in this county. Can I just break it down to you that way? 21 years of my life, I grew up in this county, of all the churches all over this county, and not one person, not a half a person, ever told me how to be saved. Not a one. You say, well, man, you grew up, you're 21, and been that long in Richmond County, been that long in the Bible Belt of the United States and North Carolina. Surely somebody have told you. Yeah, after I got saved, that's what I thought. But before I got saved, I never heard it. How many of you tonight had ever heard it before you got saved? Not many. Hey, so don't be naive and deceive the thing that everybody knows. It's religious apostasy. It's just like the days of Noah. Nobody's knowing. Nobody's telling it. Amen. Amen. It's religious apostasy. The earth is full of cults and false religions everywhere. I mean, you, you name it, they got it. I said, well, they don't, denominations don't get you to heaven. You're exactly right. But you ever wonder why there's so many of them? You ever thought why there's so many different cults in this old world? And that's what you ought to call them. Some of them just straight out cults. Yeah, the Catholic denomination is a cult. The Jehovah Witnesses is a cult. Amen. The Church of Christ, amen, they're a cult. Yeah, amen. Thinking that you got anybody that preaches, that works, is the way to be saved, it's a cult. The Bible says, bid them not God's speed. They don't believe Jesus Christ is God, and he's the only way. Hey, they're preaching a damnable heresy is what they're doing, amen. It's religious apostasy. They deny the blood, just like, just like Cain did. They deny the blessed hope that he's coming again, and they deny the book, amen. They don't want nothing to do with God's book and God's blood and God's hope, amen. It's religious apostasy. We see it everywhere. Hey, 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 and you know what they'll do? They'll kill you to shut your mouth. That's what Cain did to Abel. Religious apostates. He said, just like the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. You know what you got today? You got religious apostates. He said, well, nobody's preaching the pure, unadulterated gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ through the blood of Jesus Christ only. Yeah, amen. And if you don't go that way, they'll kill you. They'll kill you with the tongue, and some of them even kill you with a sword. You know what you saw over there in some of the pictures early on in, over there in Afghanistan and these other places? De-heading of Christian people, cutting off heads. Hey, that's what he's talking about, just like the coming of the Son of Man. You're seeing it. They're trying to shut you up. And if you go down to your job, they'll treat you that way with their mouth. Yeah, he's saying people that go to churches all over the county, I hate you if you start talking about Jesus being the only way. Yeah, oh, you think your religion is better than everybody else. You think your church is better than everybody else. We're not talking about a church. We're not talking about hope well. We're not talking about a building. We're talking about the blessed hope of the Lord Jesus Christ. But that's the way they'll turn it on you. It's religious apostasy. He said it's going to be just like the days of Noah. What was it? There was religious apostasy. What else was it? Look in Genesis chapter 4. Look down in verse number 16. Genesis 4, 16. He said, go back and look. Here's what it was like. He's going to show you just what it's going to be like when he comes. Genesis 4, 16. And Cain went out from the presence of the Lord. There was religious apostasy in those first 15 verses. Verse 16, And Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Eden. They run away from truth, and Cain's a fleeing. What's Cain doing? Cain's traveling. Do you know what you see today in America? You see not only religious apostasy, or should I say around the world, amen, not just America, not just Richmond County, but the world in general, hey, prior to the coming of the Lord, prior to the flood, what was it like? There was religious apostasy, but they was traveling at, at the age of speed. Do you know what people are doing everywhere? They're flying everywhere. They're moving to and fro. Hey, you'd be surprised. We rode out to Colorado to do a little elk hunt. I don't know how many people we met from all over the world. Just traveling, going, moving, as, and just like Cain, flee, fleeing for the presence of the Lord. Everybody's going everywhere. Hey, just traveling at the speed of light. Amen. Just going there. Hey, you know what he said in Matthew chapter number 24? And he's talking about the signs of the coming Lord. He said, pray that your flight be not on the Sabbath. A flight? What flight? Well, he's just talking about travel. Maybe he is, or maybe he's prophesying about planes. Maybe he's trying to prophesy about people going all over the world, amen. Hey, America itself is a med melting pot of all religions, and it's the traveling that's broken down the borders to allow a religious apostasy all over the world. 
They're flying in from India. They're flying in from Mexico. They're flying in from Afghanistan. That's just flying around, amen, traveling at a light speed just like Cain took it out there. It's travel. Daniel chapter 12, verse 4 says this, Many shall run to and fro. Daniel's a prophecy book. We're talking about what it's going to be like when he comes. They shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. You know what this traveling has done? It's brought worldwide knowledge. I mean, they're traveling at the speed of light, but knowledge is traveling at the speed of light. Hey, people are ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of truth. But, But they know everything nowadays, don't they? But they don't know nothing about God. Knowledge is increasing. Amen. Hey, the technology and the knowledge that people has. You know what it is? It's just a fulfillment of what's, going, what's yet to come. The knowledge of the days of Noah. How much did they have? Hey, you'd be surprised what they had. Just as if you knew everything that was going on in this world, we'd be surprised. The age of speed of travel and knowledge. Amen. It's, it's everywhere. There's religious apostasy. There's traveling at the speed of light and knowledge and, and, and literal travel. Hey, you know what else is going on in the days of Noah? They're city building. Look in Genesis chapter 4, verse 17. And Cain knew his wife, and she conceived, and bare Enoch, and he built a city. First time that word's mentioned. And called the, called the name of the city after the name of his son Enoch. This is not the Enoch that God raptured out. This is Cain's child. Hey, he said it's going to be like the days of Noah. There was religious apostates. There was traveling at the light of speed. There was city building. Hey, 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 man was placed in a garden and began to build cities. You remember the Tower of Babel when they all came together, building that great, God confounded the language and spreading them apart. That wasn't God's, God's plan. God's plan was for man to be in a garden. You know what man has done? He's tried to build his cities. He's tried to make a name for himself. Hey, there's big cities all over the world now. You know what most of the hell raising's done is done in big cities. Hey, when people were living more rural lives, amen, in, in country uh, uh, upbringing of farming and the way God planted it in the garden, that's why he wanted it. But man is evolved in all this knowledge and building cities and building big buildings. It's, hey, hey, it's what they call breaking Amish. You've heard that phrase, ain't you? You know what they're actually doing? They're leaving the old, old rural places and they're going to the city life. We make a joke out of it, but you know what they're doing? They're going to explore their wild roots, man. They're going to take a drink and dive into this old world, amen. It's the city living that's destroying this world. Do you know, do you know they, I looked it up today. Statistics say that 83% of the world lives in cities. You live in a city? I live in a city. But you know what it, the, the principle is there? That city living brings a hellish lifestyle. You want to get into something that's wicked, go to the city. Do you know what? When you were raised on the farm, we can still relate to some of that generation that's here tonight. Hey, you didn't have all the technologies and the, and the avenues of sin that the city people got. You had to go to the city to get in the movie theater. You had to go to the city to go to the ABC store. Hey, wasn't as much outreach as out there on that farm, Brother Brooks. That's out there maybe chewing a little tobacco and maybe, maybe cussing a little bit, amen. Hey, but you didn't have the outreach and the technology that the city had. But if you can just get to the city on Friday nights, right, sow your wild oats and get a hold of the world. Hey, 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 what's it just like the days of the coming of the Son of Man? Hey, they were building cities in Noah's day. They were getting a, a great uh, technology into this world. And that's where we're at today. Right. It's just like the coming of the Son of Man. Amen. It's the city lifestyle. Amen. Farm life and the simple living is for the, for the most part is gone. Eighty three percent of the people live in the city. The city is the place where people go to sin. He said, just like days of Noah. There it was. Cain went out from God and he built a city. Go to any big city and see if you don't smell and feel the wickedness of that world. This world. Me and Angela went to New York City. We told you a little bit about it. Wicked. You name the city. It's wicked. City building. Just like the days of Noah. So shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. What, it, what else did you see? Look in verse chapter 4. Here's the, the religious apostasy leads the people going out and venturing and traveling to get into something. And when they travel out to get into something, they go to these cities and that's where they get it. And you know what it does? Here's, it's kind of like a, a, a domino effect. Look in verse number 19. The Bible said, And Lamech took unto him two wives. The name of the one was Adala, and the name of the other was Zillah. 
Amen. You know what you see next? And the days of the, uh, Noah, the flood, the days of the coming of the Son of Man, you see religious apostasy, you see travel at the age of speed, you see city building, and you see the breakdown of the home. The home is destroyed for the most part. What did he do? Lame, it took two wives. Polygamy. You, know, you want to see the coming of the Son of Man? It's going to be like the days of Noah. You'll see the breakdown of homes. Homes is a thing of the past. People don't get married no more. They cohabit. Or should we say they shack up? Or should we say they commit fornication and adultery, what God calls it? Amen. Hey, but that's, a home is destroyed. There ain't no homes no more, for the most part. Hey, there's polygamy everywhere. There's divorces every time you turn around. Hey, marriage is a thing of the past. Manners are thrown out the door. Hey, uh, morals are gone out the window. Hey, the home has been broke down. That's the way it was in the days of Noah. That's the way it'll be in the day of the coming of the Son of Man. It's no different. We better wake up and smell the coffee. Yeah, amen. When you live in a world where they can't tell, you can't come out and say I'm a man without offending somebody. When you've got to be gender friendly, whether it's men with men and women with women, it is an abomination in the eyes of God. The home has been destroyed. Yeah, hey, the sons of God, those are angels we'll look at in a little while, laid with the daughters of men. It wasn't a godly line of self. It was men of renown, giants being built and born in this whole world. It's the same way today. Hey, it's a wicked generation we're living in. And the homes have been broke down. We better wake up. God's coming. He's a coming. There's a breakdown of the home. Romans 1 is literally being fulfilled. Amen. Hey, when you got to go somewhere, we was out somewhere in Colorado this week, and you've seen it all over the world. Ain't no different. You ride all around the world. It's the same way. You go to a bathroom, they got two of them. And it used to be one with a picture of a man and one with a picture of a woman. Remember those days? Now one of them has a man, a woman, and something. Literally. The next door, it said a man, a woman, and something. That's the world you're living in. You can't offend nobody. Hey, stay out of the woman's bathroom, boy. Stay out of the man's bathroom, go. Go in your own bathroom and be who God made you. Yeah, it's a breakdown of the home. Amen. If you preach that way nowadays, people ain't going to like it. Hey, but it's just like the days of Noah. They didn't like his neither. Amen. And the Lord's coming anyhow, and he's going to straighten out this mess. Amen. Homes have been broken down. You know, our, our homes are broken down, and we have filled the jails instead of the church. Right. Look at it. You go, you go to the jail houses. You may have been in the, some of you men have been in the jail. Some of you maybe visited people in the jail. Hey, you know what's amazing? The statistics show that most people in those jail houses come out of broken homes. Why? Because when you break down something that God has instituted, all it does is destroy everything else. Homes are busted up and jails are full. When the homes were together, the churches were full. That's where we're at. You break down the homes, you're going, to break, you're going to put people in jail. You keep your home together, there's a good chance your family will stay with God. Amen. There's a breakdown of the home. Hey, hey just like the days of Noah, look in verse number 20, number 5. There's an agri agricultural and advancement. He said, just, he, Jesus, Jesus said it's going to be just like the days of Noah. Go back and check it out. Go back and read it. Chapter 4, verse 20, the Bible says, And Ada bare Jabel... He was the father of such that dwell in tents and such as have cattle. He thought he just threw it in there and he had cattle. What's God showing you? God's showing just like the days of Noah, there's the advancements of agriculture. You ever seen such advancement in the agricultural world where they can crossbreed animals? Where, where you can throw a little uh, chick in a, in a chicken house and in no time he comes out a full-grown chicken? That ain't the way it was, ain't the way it was, how long? Six weeks? Full-grown and you eating him at the table. Advancement. Hey, hey, God said he was as such as had cattle. There was an advance. There's an advancement. Amen. There's an advancement of seed crossing. And you got all kinds of different types of corn. Maybe you like to cross bread stuff. Hey, but all it is is a, it's an agricultural advancement. It's God showing you a little signs of what's coming to pass. Hey, you can't do nothing but look outside and see God's coming again. Amen. It's advancement. Agricultural. Amen. Uh, the, the breeding of animals. The, the hybrid seed crops, amen. The speed of animal growth and the process of what's going on. Hey, hey, it's showing you the times that you're living in. We thought it was just getting some chicken on the plate. We thought it was just making some different types of uh, vegetables for the garden. No, God's showing you a picture of where you're heading. If you lift up your eyes, 
Your redemption draweth nigh. Let me give you, I got to hurry. Verse 21, it's the age of music. And his brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of all such as handled the harp and organ. Amen. People worship music. You can't go anywhere without it playing. Now you get out of your car at Walmart and they're blasting. Yeah, amen. You ever thought what's going on? You, you, you remember what those, those uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Nebuchadnezzar played the music and said, when you hear the sound bow? When, when, when Saul had that evil spirit in 1, Corinthians, 1 Samuel 16, 16, they asked Daniel, David to play on the harp to soothe his spirit. There's something about that music. It produces worship. Yeah, hey, you can't go to town half the time and find anybody that ain't got something crammed in their ear. And some of you young people got it crammed all in your ear and think nobody knows what's going on. There's a God that knows what's going on. And you better be careful. It's probably why you got the spirit that you got. Because it affects your spirit. Uh, it's just a song, just a music. No, it's more than just a song. It's more than just a music. Hey, the devil was that anointed cherub with the organs. Amen. He knows his music. Stage of music. Stage of worship. If you ain't careful, it'll slip into your church. And you pick up that spirit of that music and it takes the place of preaching. Yeah, amen. Preach it, bro. Yeah, we're there. We're there. Hey, he, he said, hey, there he was. Look in, let me skip on. Verse number, number, number seven. It's the age of steel buildings. Uh, Genesis 4, 22. And Zelah also bare Tubal Cain, an instructor of every artificial brass and iron. And the sister of Tubal Cain was Nama. Amen. They're building. You know what they're building it for? They're building out of steel, iron. Hey, a uh, 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 brass, these metals. The, some of you remember the, the age of steel buildings? You know why they built it out of steel? Because they wanted the last. There ain't no God coming. We don't need it out of, out of wood. It's going to decay. We're building it to last forever. They're trying to bring in a kingdom. What is it? Lastly, number eight, it's the age of violence. Look in verse 40, uh, 23. The Bible said this. The Bible said, And Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, those two he had shacked up with and committed adultery and fornication with. This progress is just falling downward, or should say decay, not progress. Lamech said to his wives, Hear my voice, ye wives of Lamech, hearken unto my speech, for I have slain a man of my wounding and a young man to my hurt. And then he goes to justify, you know, Cain got by, why not me? It's the age of violence. You ever seen so much violence? You got a little taste of it the other year, the last year, was it? Burning down cities, rioting and all over the world. Hey, we ain't seen the half of it yet, of the violence that's coming, amen. He said, just like it was in the days of Noah, they kill and feel justified for it. Go shoot a cop and you feel like you've done service. Calling good evil and evil good. Hey, hey killing babies by the multitude at the, at, the, at the name of pleasure. Abortions. Murder is what it is. And they're they're, they're giving uh, old people medicine to get them out of here sooner, to get them out people's uh, conscience and get them out of their lives so they can go back to living the way they want to live. It's a killing violence generation. Just like it was the days of Noah. So shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. They murdering babies. They murdering children. They're murdering adults. They're murdering grandparents. Hey, it's the world that we're living in when you see these things come to pass, lift up your eyes, your redemption draweth nigh. Amen. If we're seeing the signs of the end of the tribulation, just like it was in the days of Noah, we're seven years prior to getting out of here to that end. L- l- let me, let me, let, look at 2 Peter 3. I'll stop there. 2 Peter 3. You know, what, you know what John said, Revelation 22, 20, and 21? Even so, come Lord Jesus. Get me out of stinking mess. Hebrews, James, 1 Peter, 2 Peter. 2 Peter. You got it? Look in verse 3, chapter 3, 2 Peter 3. He said in 1 Thessalonians 5, 6, he says this. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. 2 Peter 3 and 11 says this, Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved. You see it's about to happen? Look what the next phrase says. 
what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? We see where we're at. What should we be doing? What was Noah doing? He's sticking to the stuff. Still trying to raise his family right. Still trying to stay away from the violence. Still trying to keep a home together. Still trying not to give into the age advancements of this world and dive into his thinking and mentality and worldly living until the Lord took him home or flooded the earth and took everybody else home. The days of Noah and the days of the coming of the Son of Man. The Lord's coming and we better get ready. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Maybe you'd like to come pray tonight about something God spoke to you about. Maybe somebody on your life maybe needs to know the Lord. Maybe something the Lord's been burdening you with. He's a coming. Well, we better tighten up.